with some of the stuff you were saying there, again, we're just pulling from other parts of the world, sounded a little bit like Macron. When Macron had that surprise victory in France, he pulled people in from the community. He was neither left nor right, but he was a, a message of hope. Is this what's, or, or, well, without saying you following Macron's model, but where is your inspiration for Bozer coming from? Yeah, we are following some of what Macron taught. Because I think, I like you, I don't know, I'm sick and tired of the negativity that happens. And I get it. When the lights are off and there's no water, we have reason to be negative. But what the stat shows that if there were a thousand members of parliament, centrists are winning, is starting to tell me that actually citizens are looking for pragmatic solutions rather than ideologically entrenched ideal. Citizens actually want someone who can fix the lights and do all of that. That's the first. The second is actually politics, as Obama said, is too important to be left up to politicians. So we have to go ask people with skills. My problem is this, is that when I look at the lists that have been put up that were signed on on Friday, all I see in there is stale bread. People who were there in 2019 over, like, I mean, even the president, he now claims complete amnesia about state capture. What we need is citizens in communities who are working day in, day out, coming together, bound by shared values, shared ideals, a vision that they can say they can come together. And I'm finding great success in that, not because, you know, we tried it to great difficulty in 2021, so we learned some lessons. Now coming forward, I'm confident that I see Ayanda is here. I see people like Nobuntu. I see so many of them who are here, who previously were not in parliament. They were not in politics, but they were able to put up their hands and say, I want to serve my country and I don't need to be a politician. I just need to know who I represent and against what values I do it. So we're finding what are the distinctive of BOSA is that as people were saying, published lists, published whatever, I published our list last year already because we went and found the candidates and said, here are the candidates, if there are criminals amongst them, we will remove them immediately without having to submit them to the IEC. So to me, we've got to give power back to the people, and that's a practical way of doing it. What about those two million that you spoke about, those two million votes that don't seem to be registering anywhere? Again, I'm going to use an international example. When Obama came to power, he used innovation, a lot of it in social media, a lot of it in ways that had not been applied in the American system. Your social media footprint is huge. For those who don't know, Muzi has got more than 2 million followers on Twitter, 300,000 on Facebook. The interview that we did the other day with Ayanda got more than 100,000 people viewing it for 10 minutes of view. That's not TikTok, 30 seconds. That's proper interest. Can you give us some insight into how this is maybe influencing and shaping your perspectives of where Boza might be sure. uh, getting itself in the election? I mean, our online game is also heavily supported by a grassroots effect. And I'll come back to the online bit, but the grassroots bit. So on every given day, we've got over a thousand Bossa champions going to communities, engaging people, talking to them. On every given day, we've almost got activists who are going around. I mean, I spend more time away from home than I do at home. So I think my kids have cause for concern. Every time I come home, they're like, who is that man coming in, you know? But along with all of those tools, we've migrated because it has to support by the online bit. And so, yes, I'm fortunate enough to have built a very strong support on social media. And we're clear that that doesn't always translate into votes, but we work to engage and conscientize people about our message. And what's great on social media, because sometimes Twitter or X can be a bit like a shabine. Anyone says whatever they feel like saying. We've just, I just got a research piece that indicated that our message is not contested for in that it's central. You get a lot of people on social media who are race-mongering, race dividing on that space, and it increases likes. 
we are on a free pathway where we're not xenophobic, homophobic. We're simply sitting in that space where South Africans are engaging us. So we've spent a lot of time onto that. We are also deploying other tools. We've launched a crowdfunding initiative on there. We're busy with WhatsApp channels that allow for people to be able to talk continuously. And we'll be deploying new tools recent, uh, in the next while that will ensure that even people can engage with our manifesto on WhatsApp to talk about. I think the age old way of running a political party by saying you want branches and you want this is archaic, it's Marxist, and it speaks to an old world. We need new, fresh political organization going forward. And that's part of what we do. And are the youngsters going to come out and vote? Young people sadly are under-registered as a percentage of the broader population. Right? So my audience sits between 24 to 39, those guys. The new registration targets that have come through, so an additional, I think the IEC registered at just over a million new voters. Uh, we're doing an we're trying to understand what that new voter looks like. But again, if I come back to the two million game changer conversation, is that a million of them are dissatisfied with the ANC. These are South Africans that in any poll would make the case to say, I'll stay at home, won't vote, that kind of thing. So we've got to turn those out. And then secondly, amongst the new voter population and the younger ones, and as I said, all the way to 30 to, to 43, so kind of my age spectrum, are very keen to come out and say, how do I find something new and new leaders? So yeah, as a proportion, I think young people will turn out if they're inspired to realize that their vote will matter. And I don't want to assume, as most polls say, that the ANC under that premise will be below 50. We've still got to go out and earn it. That's why even in earning signatures to register, we went out and engaged people. We will be increasing that to make sure we get it close to a million so that more and more people are directly engaged with our message. We're talking about the sig uh, signatures. How many have you now got on the, on the list? I think last you cover size was 160,000. So we're, we're, we're growing. Uh, I mean, as I say, our teams will be back. We had to give them a break after we had to submit <laughs> last week at the IEC. Now they'll be back on and we want to try and get that at least certainly in the next number of weeks uh, we'll be over 200,000 and then we want to just ramping up to the eight weeks towards the elections, try and ramp that number much higher than that. So that means you're going back to Parliament. That means more people who share Musi's values are going back to Parliament. Are you? <laughs> I, I myself... <laughs> uh, I will be going back to Parliament. And I don't just want to go back alone. I think we need more people in Parliament. So in real numbers, if you get over 1.2 million votes, you've got 10% of the seats in Parliament, which are over 40 people, and any proportional seats you might accrue after that. So I want to send more people. But we also want to send people to legislatures and to various places because when it's said and done, this election will need some form of anchor tenant, someone who sits in the middle, who's able to go if parties within the MPC and many others need to get a majority over 50%, we can be able to work with them to ensure that we build a government of centrists with that 10-point plan I just tabled earlier so that we know how to chart our way for prosperity. Tell us about your view on the MPC. I think that initiative by the DA is, is important on that score. My sense is uh, and I've traveled with many of the leaders who are in the MPC. We took a view that says we can't be in the MPC because there are voters who naturally aren't going to leap over and just vote for the MPC. And even if you just take all the numbers of the parties within the MPC, they still don't cross the 50 plus 1% mark. So when I said to you earlier, my race is against someone like Julius Malema, because Julius represents a set of values, as I represent a set of values. So we have to beat those values, because as we've learned in democracies all over the world, you don't have to be the majority party or the biggest parties to have influence on the values of the big parties. Ask in Germany, Angela Merkel's party 
had to be dragged by the alternative for Deutschland of those values because it kept pulling them. And here was a relatively uh, new party compared to the CDU, but they were pulling them in a direction. And if the same happens in South Africa, you can appreciate that maybe before the ANC went talking about land, but as the EFF look like they're growing into their support, now suddenly there's a bigger conversation in that space. I don't want us to lose the values, centrist, market-friendly economy, all of those where we advocate from, we can't lose those. So if I was in the MPC, the message is muted in our view. We have to be independent of that so that voters who are looking for that centrist ground can find a home so that we can be able to deliver the 50 plus one balance of power. I know you're a student of politics and you would have no doubt studied the Fonsel Slabbert story quite well. Like you, he was the leader of the opposition. Like you, he left parliament. Unlike you, he didn't go back. I That's wish he didn't, yeah. the question, if he, yeah. he might have. Are there any parallels there? Absolutely, because even drawing on the electoral reform conversation, which so loosely was called the Fancel Slavet Report, he understood the fact that the sustainability of democracy in this country could only work if you really bring democracy back to the people. You know, Alec, we can sit in this room and we can live in Amanas, and we can enjoy the securities that come with a neighborhood such as this one. But there is another South Africa, and in, it's in that South Africa that we need to be able to intervene, invest in infrastructure, build a township economy so that it can prosper. Having grown up in both worlds, I know that until such a time, and I want to say this to everybody here, until such a time that we can elect public leaders who can represent a multiplicity of races and constituencies, then we will know true freedom. We will not know that until we tend to think to ourselves, actually, without drawing the constituencies properly, we must then say only a colored leader can represent colored people, only a Zulu person can represent Zulu people, or only an Afrikaans person can represent Afrikaans people. We keep that, then we've lost democracy. But when we can be able to come back to constituencies, so that if you are the constituency leader of Hermanus, you represent the wealthy and the poor, you are able to fight on both those issues, and the electoral bill makes that possible, then I will know that the future of democracy in South Africa is secure. But otherwise, if I just go back to parliament to keep status quo, I think I might join Fancel Slabbert and not go back. Yeah, you and Michael Louis have worked very hard on, on that and getting that through. But I suppose one of the big mysteries in South Africa is you are, in virtually every poll, the second most popular politician in the country behind Cyril Ramaphosa. Any poll. It'll come out, Ramaphosa won, Maimani two. Even though Maimani hasn't been in parliament for five years. Can you take that popularity and translate it into actual votes in the next election? And if so, how? The, 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 the exercise we're engaged with now is South Africans don't know, don't universally yet know build one South Africa. South Africans know me, and I still bump into some South Africans who still say, hey, where's your party? What's going on? The hard work we've got to do is merge those two things as a first. The second thing that when you ask the question, how does that take that popularity and translating? It certainly allows us into many households. I'm privileged to be able to speak eight languages. I come as a descendant of a mixed family. My mother's Tosa, my father's Swan. Which means that it's not just geographic popularity. It's not just how king is. It's also that the Africa based in Cape State is Tosa Ravushi. Or if I leave the Eastern Cape Rea Wolum Poporwe Kasepedi. Or if I'm in KZN Siakulumis Zul. It allows me to enter the home of a diversity of South Africa. That's why to your hundreds, or over 140,000 signatures, they don't just come from one area. That popularity means 
we are con we are able to contest in Mpumalanga. We are contesting nationally in every province because that acceptance is there. So to translate that is really about spending as much time going into those communities, being able to focus on community radio and speaking to people, but using that favorability that we enjoy with so many South Africans to not only to be able to invite them to vote for Bossa as we put up posters and all of that and fund an election campaign so that when they come out, they recognize that this is a South African that we share common values with and I've been able to attract South Africans who share incredible diversity in the midst. So what's beautiful is that I saw its first instant in the caliber of candidates that are standing. They are diverse. I look at our lists, there are black people, there are white people, there are colored people, there are Indian people, because that translatability to as many different communities is helpful, and also each of those candidates have then got the freedom to go into their constituencies and talk to someone, to talk to South Africans about someone South Africans have met before, and that helps. So where are you seeing Bose's numbers? on May the 29th, 80 days time. We, we want to, at a minimum, try and target just over, uh, We, as I say, it's a 2 million votes election. We're kicking off, we want to get over 1.2 million because that will give us a seat in the room. Having managed coalitions, I know some ways what it takes. I know some of the difficulties that happen. And I've got a privilege to have been able to build a relationship with the leaders that are here. I mean, despite... Even the DA, despite history, despite all of that, I still speak to their leadership, speak to people. I still speak to uh, leaders across even the multi-party charter. I was grateful even when we got onto the ballot, I got calls from leaders in the multi-party charter to say, we're so grateful you are in it. So I'm wanting to take those 1.2 million votes so that we are in the room to negotiate and build strongly from there. But that for us, is where we want to start and push that number as far up as we can. So that's going to be the, that's going to be the story. It's going to be who, how many chips you have on the table and the discussions that go from there. Now, when we look at things like the Brenthurst uh, research that they brought out this week, yesterday, mm. you don't feature at all. I read through that report, and it's an interesting one, right? Because there are a couple of things. One, it puts us at over 5% in Gauteng in the same report, which is a significant part, right? Secondly, we know from where we sit what it takes to reach communities that maybe in their reporting, when you ask the question, still don't always know, kind of would rather say don't know and all of that. So we're comfortable that in the undecided vote, we are the choice that sits there. Thirdly, I think people may not know Bosa, but they know Musi Maimani. So I'd be interested to understand what was the framing of the question. Because if the question gives you a fixed multiple choice that says, who are you going to vote for, ANC, DA, EFF, this or that? Of course, once that, and I've done polling, once you put that ballot before people, those are the choices that are before them. The hard yards that we've got to do is in understanding what went into the questioning is to also then ask further, where does Bossa sit? Where does all of that? And I'm working not with the Brentas research. We're working with a number of other polling companies. And certainly the reports that we're getting are different. Like, for example, I'm uncertain when I look at that Brentas report that suddenly Zuma or the MK party has gone to 13% higher than the EFF in a climate that sits like. That seems way overbaked and it doesn't ring credible to me. So I'm worried about the narrative that it puts on the table. I'm comfortable enough that if we do the hard yards, my own favorability, meeting people, the candidates that we've got, we should be able to achieve the electoral outcomes I've just spoken about. It's your turn. Uh... Afternoon, Rizzi. Well done, and uh, wish you all the best. Um, I have a question for you. Through the... Um, both the champions that you have out there for social media and all the mechanisms that you have at hand to promote yourself, your party. I think 
one of the biggest challenges you have, and I'm, that's my question, the receivers of grants, we're talking about probably about 8 million people here in South Africa that feel maybe intimidated, maybe feel that they... Um, I, I really don't want to lose you as a friend. No, no, What's your question? 15 seconds. How are you going to convince them that given as this grant and feel that they are obliged to follow the ANC, how are you going to change that? Thank you. Good question. It is a good question, but I think also we must attend to the psychographic nature of those voters. Voters, even on grants, prefer jobs ahead of grants. Convincing them is about making sure that people understand, and one of the policy positions is to talk about a basic income grant that is unconditional to whether you work or not. Because the fear for most people is that they know once they start working, they cross over the threshold of being able to be a recipient of welfare support. So I, when I've been in communities and asked people, which would you rather have? They want a job. No mother wants their child to be a pensioner at 18, just waiting for a child grant to stay at home. No, no one wants that. In fact, people even don't want to live in these RDP homes as another way. Because they say, and you're in your hogar. I'm not a snake that I should live in a hole that I didn't build for myself. People want to be empowered. So yes, we've got to work harder at communicating the jobs message. That's why I in Action Manifesto anchors itself in a job in every home and people are desperate for that. So long as they can see that actually it's possible for them to work and for their kids to work. So that's the message, if you like, that we've got to get there. Why it was hard to get some of the signatures if you're willing to do it legally is because that fear does exist. When you say to someone, give me your ID number and your signature, they think you will take those ID numbers and give them to the ruling party so that they know who supported a different party or not. So we've got to be clear, voter education, your vote is your secret, you are not going to have anyone take away your grant. And that's why I was so bitter. I still remain when people were like, you shouldn't be governing in Johannesburg, what, 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 what. Because it was important for people to see in 2016 that governing in Joburg outside of Cape Town at the time when I was leader of the DA needed to help voters know that actually after a new government comes into play, the sun doesn't stop shining, your grants don't disappear, and actually life does get better. So let's not allow the government to spew out lies about grants dis disappearing and focus on an economic plan. Because actually, when I speak to South Africans, regardless of where they are, they want a pathway to prosperity. And most people know that that's through a job. Tell us about H. Chichalima and how he inspires you. My very uh, good friend, H.H. Uh, Maybe tell the people here. They might not even know who he is. In, uh, I think it was in 2016, I, uh, we, when we set up a partnership of opposition leaders in the SADC region. And I had leaders from Zambia, Zimbabwe, all the SADC countries, opposition leaders that we would work with to support. So in about 2016, 2017, I get this phone call to say the leader of the opposition in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, has been illegally detained. I flew on a plane with, uh, funny enough, Jordan Hill Lewis, who's the mayor of Cape Town, and uh, another guy who we off we went to Zambia. And when we got to Zambia, of course, we got arrested at the airport, and we were told we could not come into the country. I was kicked out, I was deported. They took all my technology. I remember I had to hand over my iPad, all of those things. And then we then raised the issue. It became like a media storm, and then I became... I wanted to fight for democracy in Sadek region. I organized for HH to fly all the way to South Africa. I was in parliament. I looked at Jacob Zuma. I said, tell that man sitting in the gallery why you are supporting Edgar Lungu in Zambia at the time. And so there was nothing more beautiful to know when a leader of the opposition had fought so doggedly and continued even despite prison, all the support. It was so nice when we got invited to his inauguration. And at the same airport when we landed, I saw the same army generals coming to the plate. I thought they were going to arrest me. But I tell you, 
you get a different feeling when you moonwalk across the red carpet going, I'm off to the inauguration, y'all. So it was really great. So he's been a genuine inspiration, but it's not the only one, you know. We've worked with Lazarus Chakwera in Malawi. Sure, he's had a difficult turn of it in government, but um, he's been someone we, we worked with when he was here. Um, we have some disappointments. I'm working with Nelson Chamisa in Zimbabwe. I'm coordinating some of the work with the Umbrella for Change in Botswana with uh, the, B, the, uh, the BP the BB party there, that's led by Dumelang Sesale Shando, who I'm almost certain will become the next president there if the elections work well there. Uh, so I'm interested in democracy in the region because we can't deal with immigration without fixing the fact that we've allowed Emerson Mnangagwa to wreck Zimbabwe, and to wreck, to wreck Zimbabwe, and then we moan when Zimbabweans are coming into South Africa and make it a xenophobic issue. Fix democracy there. What, what inspired me when I first heard that story was how impossible it was for HH to become president of Zambia, and yet it's happened. And you know, today we are in a very different situation to when I first heard that story where it looked impossible to happen in South Africa, and here we are. Uh, sorry, I'll try and make it quick. Uh, first of all, thank us very much for your inspiring speech. Um, I just want to, to give us a size and numbers of the organization in your party. I think you mentioned something like 2,000 people going out to sell your policies. On voting day, what kind of organization do you have to get people out to vote? I'll, so so uh, there are in the country 24,000 voting stations, right? Our job is, we've been doing, we did this work quite early on in the year I know where each province numbers are allocated and how you cut and dice that 1.2 million because you know how Ting is the biggest. So you deploy the majority of your resources there. You look at what happens in KZN. You look at what happens in... So, so in real numbers... Sorry, sir. Would you just allow him to answer, please? Okay, he wants so to know you, the size of your organization. The size of the organization, I mean, in many ways, we will have, we already had, before the signatures debacle, over 40,000 activists that were sitting on our database for them to be able to be deployed into these voting stations. And they add to the numbers of people that are going through. Does that help? Mr. Maimani, yes, sir. Uh, I echo his gratefulness for the inspiring address. Um, in 1994, the ANC won the election with 62%. Uh, um, if you tally the Brenthurst report um, poll now, it also aggregates to about 62% between MK, the EFF, and the ANC. Um, therefore, it would appear that in 30 years, none of the leaders on the capitalistic side has been able to tilt the scale even marginally between the idealistic divide. Why do you think that is? And whatever the answer is to that question, is that not the place to start to actually shift the current gridlock? So it, it, it does present the challenge that we face. And I've spoken at length about the fact that those grouping of parties represent something. But I think we mustn't lose track about the fact that actually South Africa, we did see some change in 2016 at the metros. In fact, when I was leader of the DA, at the time, the majority of local government budget was administered under a DNA coalition. The error that we make is to simply reduce the election. And I feel sometimes we make this mistake to just simply say, bash down the ANC enough times until, if you like, the tree falls down, if you keep chopping. I actually think the tactic must be, and this is something that I'm working hard on, tell the story of what happens after the ANC because there are ANC voters that are looking for a new home. Then the debate stops becoming capitalist, socialists, whatever. The debate becomes, what is the next chapter in the South African post-liberation? That's how we, you do not win an election 
until you start to win arguments. And at this point in time, when in 2016, it was easy to say, you can pick corruption at local government or we can bring about a change. And I can even remember the ring, you know, a change that brings jobs, all of those things. We did that work. In 2019, I think citizens are asking the question to mitigate against the cynical view. What is my tomorrow like after the ANC? I'll tell you a story of my parents, maybe, because they, are, they were staunch ANC supporters. And I didn't take it for granted that they were going to vote for me because I'm their son. They had to grapple with the fact that if you run a campaign that tells them that the ANC is fraught, it's like telling people that the people who have liberated you and your parents are fraught. It's a bit like if my parents were alcoholics and you came and stood outside the door and said, how dare you, your parents are just drunkards. Even in the midst of that, I feel an obligation to defend my parents. Only I'm allowed to say they are drunkards, not you. And I think South Africans tend to treat voters who vote for the ANC, and I hear us from many parties, as though those voters are stupid for making those choices. They are not stupid. They remember a time, not only during apartheid, but after apartheid, where they actually saw electrification, where there were more houses being built than checks erected. These are not stupid voters. They know that actually, previously they had no income, now they have some income. So we can't arrive here with a basic story that just says the ANC is fraught and that's the end of that. We need to help them see their future outside of that. And yes, it does speak into the issue of race. Because if your race has been stripped away from you and you feel undignified, believe you me, when someone emits the emotion that says that your race cannot be considered and that actually your history doesn't matter, it can feel like they want to strip away your dignity. And therefore, in that case, you don't say, I'm defending corruption. You say, I'm defending my dignity from someone who will take away my dignity. So we've got to ensure, when I talk about a shift from poverty to prosperity, it is a dignity question. And we must ensure that when we tell a story post the ANC, it must be one that ANC voters like my parents can see themselves into and never feel a sense of shame. And I don't think that story was well told. It must be fair enough. Muzi Maimani, thank you.